Man, we'll be looking into it. I'm just setting it up right. Another notion here, primarily attributable to uh, the person who brought it out, they were doing it a little hard. Operate in a line or operate in a direction to threaten alternative object objective. In other words, what you want to do is put your force and go between the alternative objectives, the idea being the other guy doesn't know what you're going to go for, go for so he spreads his force out the last moment, then you take your force, operating against a fraction of his. It's a way of getting strength against weak. In other words, put your adversary in arms at their limit. Basic idea. I'll also point out, Little Hart didn't even understand his own idea. I'll bring that up later on. He actually drew that idea from Borset and also from Sherman's operations in the South during the Civil War. He drew it from, he admits that. He put that right up front. And then he goes, <coughs> another notion here, concentrate direct artillery fire and key points of support. They didn't have much indirect now. The idea is to concentrate it, and then of course you get a rupture, and then you go through and pull, roll them up from the flanks and the rear. And of course the action statements here. Napoleon was familiar with all these people, let's read it. And note the key idea here, Napoleon. The ambiguity, deception, and rapid easy movement. These are the inputs in order to achieve surprise and output. If I have ambiguity, deception, quickness, or speed, those are the kind of things you put those together. That's the ingredients through which you get your surprise. Now, very often in the military liter literature, you seem to describe deception and speed. They hardly ever mention ambiguity, and I'll show you later on, ambiguity may be even more important than deception. There are certain ways it's more important, more powerful, more limited. So I can tell you what it is now, but we're going to bring that out. Uh, I just want to get some more information, we'll bring that out why, why I make it that statement. And then, of course, guerrillas, in more informal ways, exploited these same notions. Less formality, more leverage your adversary. But there's another way you can interpret this chart. Plan in several branches. You can think that as a form of variety. Perhaps rapidity, cohesion is a form of harmony. Dispersion, concentration, other form of variety. Operating a line that's right alternative objective. Harmony plus variety. So knowing that, let's leave the top of this alone, rewrite the action statements here. It doesn't mean that these statements are incorrect, I just want to give you a richer view. So the top's the same, and all I've done is rewritten the uh, action statement. And particularly the negative side, you see the power. So you use these things to generate certain things, but if you substitute variety and harmony for uniformity, then what happens? You become less adaptable, more predictable. That's what Napoleon did. Time went on. Lots of the ability to adapt, became more predictable, and adversaries were able to use it again. That's only a very general statement. We're going to pin that down. We'll talk about Napoleon. And once again, So the impression I want to leave you with then was all these gentlemen, Sun Tzu, Sack, Jose, et cetera, those ideas are only by the regular or of work. Now why do I make that point? Because very often we like to draw very sharp distinctions between regular warfare and brutal warfare on the other hand. That's not too useful because remember there's many notions are similar in both. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you both regular warfare and guerrilla warfare and we'll keep track and show you how one interconnects with the other to come forward. Sometimes we draw a very sharp distinction, then we get, we get lost, so to speak. We don't want to get lost. I think it'd be a good time to take about a five minute break. We'll come back to the point that you guys want to take about a five minute break. We'll come back. That's nonsense. It's the only way you really generate many of these I've been in the design business. You have to take a very, you have to put assumptions in your math, your algorithms, and that. And there's other things you leave out because they're hard to measure. And, you know, just because it's hard to measure doesn't mean it isn't important. If we have some of our science engineering majors, well, I can't measure it. You mean because you can't measure it, it's unimportant. You no, know, it's important. I said, well, and you know, why are we making this sort of thing so optimal? If that's important, it's not included. How do you know it's optimal? And the diamond's only been far too Okay. Here's what we let go off. Let's go right to the next part. Now, what I want to do is I want to talk to him. 
What we're going to look at next is what I call the three giants of the 19th century. First, Napoleon, the super practitioner. Next, Clausewitz, the philosopher on war. And next, Germany, uh, sometimes called the system on war. You might say, and uh, for a couple of reasons. One, they had a very pervasive influence upon the way we look at war and conflict. In other words, they, things are inculcated and this just came out of their time in a very pervasive way. Not all good. In other words, we're maybe hanging on to some images and views that are causing difficulty. And when you have images or views that are causing difficulties, you might want to get new images or views. Otherwise, you have prescription for the game. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons why the communists have done so well against them is not because they're so clever, it's because we've been acting like mastodons in some way. Not at that. Gotta keep that in mind. I want you to keep that in mind all the way through it. We don't want to overthrow certain traditional values and offices. We, we don't want to retain those things that are going to destroy us. Okay, with that in mind, I want to look at these three people. And as I already said, because they have a very pervasive influence, we want to get to see what that pervasive influence is, and maybe get some insight as to maybe how we can think of it. Okay, with that in mind, first Napoleon, the super practitioner. When you look at Napoleon, you have to remember when he came on the scene, there were certain things that were already available, what I call it, revolutionary army gifts to Napoleon. Right here, he's out of war. First of all, we're talking about the period of the revolution. In other words, the peasants are going to get a piece of the action. Instead of being just robots or nuggets for somebody else's enterprise. So they're morally, spiritually, have all kinds of energy, dynamism. In other words, they want to play. So you have that going for you. You want to capture, you want to use that. Second, the so-called subdividing an army into self-sustaining component. Today we call it the divisional concept. It showed up at that time. It showed up even before the book. It's so-called divisional concept. Why is that important? Think of two armies fashioned together here, like I'm doing my hand. Then you have one that separates out the divisions, the intervals in between. They can get the flanks of the and literally pull the other army apart. Apart from this. Very unadaptive. Very great. Of course, you have to have a good commander to do that. But remember, Napoleon was a good commander. Third, we go with this one. Here I'm, in essence, saying poverty is a virtue. Instead of depending upon these heavy resupply columns and resupply efforts, they're literally living off the land. So they move at a much faster tempo or much faster pace. So from that viewpoint, revolutionary armies operate at a very fast pace. And in that sense, poverty was a virtue. This one you see very often in the literature, the so-called rapid march associated with 120 versus the sometimes called the, uh, the revolutionary quick step, the Napoleon quick step, 120 versus 70 steps per minute. The reason why I put those quotations around it, I'm not sure I believe that. You know, it's like a contractor's brochure. Just because it's in there doesn't mean it's true. The point is, the idea is correct. Whether it's 120 or something else, the point is, if you loosen people up, they can operate at a faster tempo or pace. You keep them tight, it's more difficult to do so. So whether the numbers are correct or not, the basic idea is correct. And the idea of the discontinued adherence to the so-called 1791 drill regulation. The regulation was prescribed the use of line and column for fighting and for movement and evolution between one and the other. The idea of means you get some kind of leverage over your adversary. They initially came out in 1788. They were modified, came out in the final form in 1791, and lasted until 1830, 1831, for a 40 year period. In other words, they were in effect before Napoleon and were in effect after Napoleon. But there was a period there where they didn't adhere to them. We'll get to that. And so if you pull all this together, here's the advantage you get over your adversary if he hasn't done these kinds of things. In other words, you get a Mobility of the force is much better than your adversary. And it raised a rather important question, particularly with respect to Napoleon. How did he exploit this superior mobility and fluidity of force? Because his warfare is characterized with mobility, fluidity, quickness, etc. So how did he exploit that? We're going to get into that right now. So let's dive into that. So I want you to look at this chart here. A little snapshot of what I call an aspect of his war. So I get it on my belt. All right, I'll just move it over. We'll pull the right side over there. Look the left side. Fairly busy chart here. The general features: plan of resolution, security, strategic dispersion, tax concentration, and vigorous offensive action. I'll let you read it, and then I'll comment on it on the left side. Don't don't read the right side. I'll get that.
Okay, let's look at the first bullet here. Know what's going on here, all these kinds of things he's doing. The idea is to find out what his adversary is not up to, so he can kind of my hypothesis, figure out what he's up to. In other words, the basis for not only simplifying his own way he operates, but also removing uncertainty with respect to his adversary. In other words, sort of an inverse for say. <coughs> know his ideas on security. All the different kinds of things he's doing. The key idea is to cloak or mask his movement vis a vis his adversary. So he's doing all these kinds of things. He's vindicated. So in that sense, you think of the security as being a chain for his vigorous offensive, which is his chief. The way it can be thought. I'm sure it's another way you can think of it. Now, note this third bullet here, which I've depicted as strategic dispersion and tactical concentration. For you people who have read the Napoleonic literature, you usually just see it described different. They'll describe it as assembly and concentration. And then you have a hard time. What do you mean the difference between assembly and concentration? When you read into it, you find out what he's doing initially, keeping his forces spread out with intervals in between. As they start closing down, he's got to get a tactical concentration. So it's an initial strategic dispersion followed by a tactical concentration. In other words, you get a sharper distinction, a better way of describing it. You know what's happening here to describe it. They have these large intervals. They start closing in and get a better picture. Then they, with a large fraction of their force, pounce upon a small fraction of their In other words, a way of getting strength against weakness. Plus the fact that they're very movements here. You're regular in rapid fashion. It has another notion of security. In other words, it has the cloaking or masking or amorphous kind of movement, too. It's hard to keep track of. Remember, if you think back to Udo, if you don't get a good observation, your orientation screwed up, your orientation screwed up, your decision screwed up, your decision screwed up, your action screwed up. So if you screw a guy's observations up, then you corrupt it up in his Udo. And once you've got that corrupted, you got things working your way. And then the fourth point, the idea of a vigorous offense, basically what it was, was to grab the initiative and have his adversary not react quick enough so he's a step or two inside them and gradually pull in their adversary apart. We can't cope, can't keep up, not adapt, and start coming blue. Okay? Now, his theme with respect to those general features, the idea of using what you see very often in literature, a single or unified line of operation. Now, don't think of it as a line, per se, in a map. Some people do. What you really think of in terms of a line, remember, these units are spread out adjacently and also longitudinally. It's a line only in the sense they're talk, trying to operate in a concerted or coordinated manner. Only in that sense. Like a line of reason. You know, you get different kinds of things, but that doesn't mean you're a party line. But that doesn't mean if you're trying to do things along a very narrow or rigid line. Now, very often it's depicted that way. It's unfortunate to use the words, but that's what's going to go. Don't think of it that way. You think of many lines which are operating in a concerted way, so in that sense, it's a single line or a line of operation. When you read that letter. The other thing is the idea is to try to grab your adversary's communication. The basic idea by doing that is to cut his line of communication, seize his line of communication, isolate his forces. So he can't get resupplied, he can't get reinforced. Also, to force him to fight under unfavorable circumstances. Plus, think of it yourself. If you're in a force, you get cut off, kind of bonded. From a very human kind of thing. And then, as a result, that employ a fraction of your force in order to divert, grab his attention, and hold him down. Then, the other force you're forced to go into his flank, go into his center, in order to pull him apart, whatever is the weak or vulnerable point. So you begin to see here, this is a chain chi. There's your chain, there's your chi. You see it right there. You have a chain chi operation there. I might add at this point, Sun Tzu was translated into French in Paris in 1772 and later on again in 1782 by the Jesuits, which revealed two things. The Chinese suspected the Jesuits were spies, and they were. <laughs> and two, the other point is it's very often suggested, no proof, people think that Napoleon did read Sun Tzu the war. And you look at some of those operations, they have some of that character, but we really don't know, at least it hasn't been uncovered in this day. But there is some suspicion because he read so many things in the military at that particular time. And the next point here, note that set up supporting centers or base of operations, local depots. Well, they didn't have formal bases, they have formal resupply efforts. What they would do is they conquer territory and set up in foraging area, they set up local depots or local bases of operation. They would set them up such that they'd have alternative lines of communication. Wouldn't only have one line of communication, but alternative. So they have one cutoff, they can appeal to another one for resupply. 
You see what that does, it frees up their freedom of maneuver, frees up their action, it gives them leverage against their adversary. It also makes them more unpredictable. Well, more uncertain, though. In any case, his aim was quite simple. Destroy enemy army. Remember what I said earlier. The rain doesn't wage wars, machines don't wage wars, people do want to use their mind. He's onto a partial truth here. He recognized if you take out the army, then you own the terrain. If you want the terrain, you may have to fight the army again and again. So in that sense, he was correct. He didn't have it all. If you look at his operations down in Spain, remember, he beat the, and destroyed the Spanish army, then he had to fight the guerrillas and lost the guerrillas. So it's not only the formal instruments you have to fight, you also have to fight the what? Informal instruments. Or the irregulars, whether it be guerrillas, people, dirty tricks, whatever it might be. Or today we have terrorists, all that kind of thing. You cause a problem. But he did have a partial truth. But he tended to think of it more of a formal instrument, as they did back in the, 19th, uh, the uh, latter part of the 18th century, early part of the 19th century. We see that kind of But note these operations up here. I'll show you this, some schematics just for you. Tie them up in one direction, hose them over here. Chain the two. Let me show you a schematic, right? what I call an idealized schematic. Of his. And I lifted this right out of the book, as indicated at the bottom. The only thing I had is the chain the chain. And what we see is what we call a strategy envelopment. Here's a pinning force here, here's a maneuver force, comes back, cuts off the lines of communication, pulls in behind them, they put the pressure on, pull the guy apart. Well, I'm never going to again. <laughs> okay, you have a pinning force here to tie up your adversary. You you know, grab his attention for the direct. In the meantime, you go down this maneuver force, comes in the back door here, cuts off his lines of communication, as one move, a part of the force, the rest of it pulls back in, so these people can't interfere, so now they have this, these people isolated. So they try to adjust this, these other people put more pressure on in order to pull your adversary apart. In other words, they're trying to adjust under very trying circumstances. What battle is that? Is that no, this is just a, <coughs> this is a, a method that you would apply over and over again in many, many battles, different ways. You see that, that kind of thing. That's one notion. I'm just trying to detect the way to change the G operation. You know, remember Patton said, hold them by the nose, kick them in the rear. You're holding by the nose, kick them in the rear. Okay, another operation called the strategy of central position. If his adversary was spread out a little bit, there are two forces there, a large interval in between, he would strike into that interval and then set in what he calls an SA, a secondary attack here to keep these people tied up. He was a major force in this force in order to grab these people and try to defeat them. And then after he did it, swing back to the other force. Well, that sounds nice and dandy, but there's a hidden assumption there. You're not going to get away with that unless you can operate at a faster tempo or pace than your adversary. That's not explicitly in that diagram. You've got to remember, there's a hidden assumption there. Providing you operate at a faster tempo or pace, you can do that. Remember, the Mongols did that kind of stuff, too. But if your operation is slow enough, you're not going to be able to play that game. Okay? Okay, with that in mind, now let's step down to his tactics. And what I'm showing you here, early example of, from an example of his early tactics, you know, an example of his later tactics here. And they were so beautifully stated, I thought I would just take the quote. The underlines are mine for emphasis. Now, I'll let you read both of these, and then I'll comment on it. For your information, both of yours means sharpshooters or, or, uh, or experiments. In any case, I'll let you read it, and I'll comment on it. Read the left, and then read the right, I want to comment on it. One other point. Remember, this didn't happen all of a sudden. You know, over time, shifted to this kind of a mode.
okay? Let's look at the left-hand side. These two underlines really, or literally, capture the essence of the statement. Note this, a general rather than minutely regulated mission. If you have a general rather than minutely regulated, what happens? If you have a minutely regulated, you lose your ability to adapt, you become very predictable. It's hard to change. General mission, you become more adaptable, less predictable. That's the key idea there. And with that more adaptable, less predictable, then you can start exploiting his so-called the chinks in his armor, in other words, exploit his weaknesses, his vulnerabilities. Now let's go to the right side. Heavy bombardment, you're attacking his strength. Fashion away. Not only that, no then. You see here these careful timing coordinate. Here you are in a confusion and combat, you have everything carefully timed. Let's see that tonight. Hard to do. Most often it isn't done, even when you want to do it. So now you're putting up a situation where you have careful timing in a very confused situation. Very difficult thing to do. Another guy, remember, he's adjusting to you too. So the point is, here we see heavy bombardment going strength against strength. You've got these very carefully timed, more minutely regulated missions, which means you become less adaptable, more predictable. Because the only way you can do that, you have to put yourself in being do very predictable things at lower and lower levels up there now. In any case, in any case, that's my essential point. Fluid adaptable on the left, less fluid, less adaptable on the right. More unpredictable on the left, more predictable on the right. So we see the evolution of his tactics over time taking place. So, let's critique that. Obviously, there's some questions related to that. Why? We begin the answer here. So when you look at Napoleon, he would critique if you find out he did exploit ambiguity deception below at the strategic level. He was, did a beautiful work all the way up to Waterloo. Unfortunately, on the tactical level, he started going back to what I call more formal battering ram methods. As a matter of fact, he reinstalled the 1791 drill regulation and even in a very heavy handed fashion. Why? Napoleon emphasized the conduct of war from the top down. He wanted to get strategic success, initial strategic success, but he gained grand tactical and tactical. And to do that, he set up what we call a highly centralized command and control center, as indicated here. Where he kept a grand design in his mind, his own marshals and generals didn't know what that was. Now, why would somebody do that? Because it gives them control over inferiors, so they can't deviate too far. Otherwise, they'll blow the whole thing apart. It's a control mechanism. Well, if they know that, and they're going to get in trouble, what are they going to do? Typically, they just pass that right down the chain of command. Any organization does that, so you get more rigid, Less fluid at the bottom level, lower and lower level. And the result's not too surprising. The strategic maneuvers, even though they're very gifted, after concentration, your tactic maneuvers become, no, they put quotes around the maneuvers there, become stereotype problems. Hence, it became very difficult as time went on to gain that tactical victory. Here's that tactical victory. Let me give you an example where they didn't adapt. In Spain, for example, Wellington, when he went against Napoleon's forces, one of his favorite schemes was to put his troops on a reverse slope with a heavy skirmisher spring. Well, if you put on a reverse slope, then you know it's kind of hard to observe how they're deployed or arrayed against you. Plus, that's one thing. So, observation-wise, you, you have a disadvantage. The other point is, it's very difficult for you to savage them, so to speak, with your own artillery on reverse slope. Plus a heavy skirmisher screen. With a skirmisher screen, then you can see what the pulling was up. Well, what happened when you come over the slope, correct, they'd be ready for him to beat the hell out of him when they come over the slope. Guess what? Same technique Wellington used against him at Waterloo later on. The point is, the pulling didn't adapt. Still used the same assault for him. Just keep that in mind. So partial critique so far. We'll actually make it more involved after we look at Clausewitz and Germany. Because remember, Clausewitz and Germany came out of the Napoleonic period. In a sense, they were trying to articulate the type of warfare that Napoleon was trying to wait. In any case, the point. Strategic flaw followed by stereotype movement is tactical assaults. In other words, I give them credit at the strategic level to knock them a bit down at the tactical level. The move becomes obvious, less adaptable, more clear. You see that. 
You were that mine? Let's look at Clausewitz, the philosopher. Of and what we find out, he draws very heavily upon the character of nature of war. And he comes up with the same statement. War is an act of policy. You use violence to impose one's will upon another. In other words, if you think about that, you recognize you've got an opponent you're working against, not just some inanimate object. Matter of fact, he makes the point. Dual or act of human interaction directed against an animate object to react. You're not sure of it. And if you don't know that, that adds what he calls uncertainty. Uncertainty of information acts as an impediment to vigorous activity. In other words, if you're uncertain, you have doubt, it acts as an impediment to activity. And he describes some of those things that add to that. Psychological more aspects of uncertainty. Psychological more forces in fact. Describes three kinds. Danger, intelligence, you're describing mental, and emotional factors. And emotional